right. Um, well, thank you guys for joining. So um, this panel, and we'll have up the whole time, is measuring the enterprise ROI of employee wellness. Um, we're not going to go through deep introductions because we're going to save more of the time um, of the conversation to actually go through, but I'll just read off each name so you can have a little sense of where people are from. Um, so we have along here Brandon Peel, uh, marketing evangelist of Imperative, um, Craig Foreman, senior people scientist at Culture Amp, um, Gordon Tobin, uh, director of enterprise sales at Headspace, and then um, Tamara Eccles, I said the right, chief uh, human uh, resource officer at XCOM. Um, and then I'm Kalina Markley, I'll be leading the panel. I work for Sequoia Consulting Group. So. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. We are going to leave 10 minutes at the end for questions, so feel free to um, take down some notes as you're going, and either we'll answer a question or get to it at the end. So, cool. All right, we'll get started. So, one of the things I wanted to do that seems a little obvious, but is actually just define what, what is wellness in culture as we kind of will be talking about it through this session. So, there's been a lot of talk on, you know, what our company is trying to do as it relates to employee wellness and well-being. How does that have an impact of culture? So, the first question I wanted to start with was maybe a quick lightning round to help clear up what exactly are we talking about when we use these terms, wellness and culture? And then I think more specifically, how are you seeing wellness? play a role in the culture of the company and likewise culture play a role in the wellness initiatives that a company does mm -hmm. Do you want to start? yeah, yeah. Uh, so shortest definition is uh, at least the way I hold it is the whole person where their mind body and purpose are online and they have a culture and a company that supports them in, in being fully actualized there at work I think there's a misnomer about wellness and health for employees when we think about culture in an organization. I agree that it's about bringing your whole self, but I think it's a lot bigger than that. I really think it's about how do you perform and how do you produce and how are you effective in your role and in the organization as a whole. And I think for employees that's around connecting. And if we have employees that are truly connected to the vision and the mission of the organization, then they can really bring their whole selves to their organizations. But it's really about how do they perform and how are they productive. And for a lot of folks, that's around how do they connect with the values of the company, how do they connect with the leadership team, and how do they connect with some of the behaviors in the organization that align with themselves. All right. Um, so, yeah, so thinking about this from a, from a high-level definition perspective, when I think about wellness, at least in my world, I think about the, you know, the programs that organizations are involved in really to help the, with, the, with creating the environments where people can really thrive. So, and that could be mentally, uh, physically, and even these days, possibly spiritually, right? Um, and emotionally. And emotionally, yeah. Yeah. Right. emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, but culture is something I think even more about, and we do a lot of work around them, maybe measuring wellness and how people feel about it. But culture, I'll just share two definitions. One, the high level definition that, definition that I like to think about is uh, the way we do things around here, right? Mm -hmm. Simply the way, and, and, and to say culture gets tossed around a lot, but just keep in mind that culture is everywhere. Anytime you get a group of people together, there's culture involved. You, you have culture in prison, you have culture in our organizations. When people get together, there's culture. And then I'll go organizationally, and I like to think about what our, our CEO, Didier, uh, speaks about. But he says, your brand is your promise to your, to your customers, your, your culture is the way you deliver on that. So I really think organizationally, I like that definition about you know, our behaviors and how we deliver. Uh, and that's how I think about culture. And who creates culture? Is it <coughs> leaders or is it employees? We create culture. Every one of us creates culture. I think, if, you know, I think we have to differentiate because um, what we talk a lot to organizations about is how do you become intentional about crafting your, your culture? Mm -hmm. Culture's gonna happen regardless. You, mm -hmm. you, nobody can say a word about it. You get enough people together. Mm -hmm. Somebody's gonna kind of emerge as a bit of a leader. People are gonna follow. There's gonna be behaviors that will take place. So, I mean, I think that's the piece. Culture always happens. Mm -hmm. It's how do we get ourselves involved and help craft and, 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 and grow cultures that are gonna help us deliver on our brand, help us deliver to be successful as organizations. That's what we're really trying to do is create you know, effective cultures. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I'll take a stab at defining. I think culture is is like a statement of self. It's your, it's your current self and aspirational self. It's who we are and who we aspire to be as an organization. So for us, it's like getting the results are important, but how you get the results is equally, if not more important. And I see values as like a set of ideals that guide and govern our actions and decisions. And so for me, when values come into play, it's an integrity thing, is if it's, it's a question of can you stick to what you have set out, you said you would do, and how you would operate. I think any great organization that I've ever observed has a really strong culture, and to your point, it's not something that comes tops down, mm -hmm. like stone tablets from the mount that sit on the side <laughs> of a wall but that never get used. It needs to be manifested 
and operationalize every day. And so we you know, are trying to drive a culture of happiness and healthiness in the workplace. So two things that we do every day, being the headspace guy, but we meditate twice a day. And just even doing that, being a cultural pillar of wellness, mm -hmm. which we believe contributes directly toward it, is uh, kind of how I like to think about culture and values. And I definitely think the great, most innovative organizations have a very intimate sense of self and everybody knows what way the organization is going. And when you have that, and people adhere to it and manifest on a daily basis, that's when the magic begins to happen, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think something interesting that you guys were each talking about, when you, as every culture is different, and as you're going through, like, it changes and things. So maybe we can really quickly touch on, too, and that concept of wellness evolving, and then it changes the culture, and the culture changes to support the wellness. So, you know, there's a lot of examples of things that are happening now, like the mental health side, or how to support parents in the workforce, or, um, you know, financial well-being, and all these different sorts of things. So maybe just giving an example of where, within your own company, or a past one, you guys have had to stretch or add add on to your culture or your beliefs and things in order to accommodate how the business is evolving in terms of its people? Um, I can have a stab at that. Yeah. So I'm actually only uh, gainfully employed by Headspace for the last, I think I'm week 13, <laughs> so pretty early on, and in a prior, so I don't know where all the bodies are buried, but I know where most of them are. <laughs> and uh, in a previous life, I worked for LinkedIn for almost nine years, as you'll see from your prospectus. And I think uh, as a sales leader there, although we had what was a pretty well-oiled machine, anybody who's worked in sales or a function where you have numbers, there's inherent stress and anxiety involved, particularly on, say, the old forecast calls, which mm -hmm. one or two people might know about. <laughs> and so uh, very early on, as part of the reason why I got involved with Headspace, but I saw that at the outset of those meetings, there was like a an environment of anxiety amongst the people, even the people who are doing well. And I strive as a leader to create an environment where that's not the case, mm. where people do have a feeling of well-being, and feel like they belong, and stress and anxiety, et cetera, can be reduced. So before I even joined Headspace, we just started me meditating. Like literally just took five minutes at the beginning of every forecast call just to relax. It lowers people's nervous systems calms them down and allows them to deliver a forecast in a way that's succinct, meaningful, and again, provides business results as opposed to being flustered. So that was one thing in a previous life that I did that was extremely changeful, profoundly impactful in terms of what we were doing and the overall emotional undercurrent of the sales floor, which I found to be extremely powerful. And I love Headspace, but if we meditated before a meeting, my executives would freak out. So the, <laughs> that wouldn't work the funny thing in I, a high-tech you know, environment with so a bunch of engineers. I tend to, so I tend to agree. Where I have a slight <laughs> departure is... Uh, and I'm super spiritual, and I believe in your product. I feel you. But I think that that's a little bit of where culture is reinforced, because that's who your company well, is. Well, we're kindred yeah. spirits. Yeah. So this is a, this is a top down <laughs> thing, but like... I think uh, a leadership uh, team's job is to set the standard, demonstrate the standard, and hold yeah. other people accountable to the standard. And so you can't just expect that people are going to do this or do any other things. You need to do it yourselves as a leadership team. And so when I think about, you know, when I w first walked into Headspace, for example, and I was a big meditator, don't forget. Yeah. And they were like, oh, yeah, we meditate every day at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. <laughs> and I'm sitting there nearly falling off my chair going, that's prime time selling time. Like, we don't, are we really going <laughs> to meditate those times? Are you for real? <laughs> But then when I did it, and I participated in it, I, anybody who's meditated in this room knows that special effect that it can have on how you relate to yourself and your emotions and those around you. And for us as a team, I mean, I agree that it does need to start tops down. That's where the culture is set. But it's also, there's a bottoms up element to it as well, where I think you can create a groundswell and it can work its way and permeate throughout an organization. I just think that was one of the better things I've done in my career and part of the reason that led me, actually the main reason that led me to my current occupation mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I would add too, you know, I work with lots of organizations um, and yes, I have my own ideology and where I want organizations to be, 
but I've really adopted this idea of meeting an organization where they are, right? If I went to work with Headspace and we were running an engagement survey with you, it would look a lot different right. than we were working right. together at XCOM. Right. Um, however, I would say there's nothing wrong with setting an intention, and mm -hmm. maybe it starts with, we start with a check-in. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe your executives get their head around, we're going to open our meetings with a check-in, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, your executives may agree that we want to move in a certain direction. However, this we're not going to meditate for five minutes. Mm -hmm. Could it be? I know we have one meeting where we just do five breaths in the beginning of a meeting. Now, even that, the whole breath thing might be much. <laughs> but a check-in sometimes is enough to start to ground people, sure. to start to get, before we just drop right into getting at it, can sure. we just get in the room? Sure. Right? And then I think over time, you, you can shift and adapt. And I also think the pressures, like you said, the, the, up, the upswell. And there's a lot of momentum coming into the organizations now. You know. that's, that, that's, that's also a, a forcing mechanism around this. But different organizations, if you, if you, I'm sure if you go into an investment banking organization, you can still bring culture in and, and mindfulness. It, it may look different. I mean, our new head of people was with BlackRock, and she brought in a meditation program. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. you opted in Yeah. versus, you know, if I work with a, you know, a, a, a young tech startup that's from day one wants to be this way. Right. So. And what you're saying is it's one size fits one. I love that. Right. One size fits one. One size fits one. It's not a one size fits all. Yeah, and so I think along with that, you know, it's with even your point, it's getting that buy-in of how do you actually get people to want to do meditation in the beginning, or how do you get them to want to invest in employee wellness? So kind of even in the theme of this panel and, and the, the topic that we were given and discussed is so with ROI, so that return on investment of doing a wellness program at your company, you know, how do you both sell that and then how do you also create it and understand it and measure it? And there's there's so much that goes into this topic, so we're gonna kind of dive into it a little bit. But I think the first thing I'll pose for you guys is, is, you know, in your own organizations, does does ROI even matter when it comes to certain programs related to wellness, or how exactly are you measuring what you're doing? Because I think I've been to a few sessions and talked with other folks where it's even just understanding, is it shifting to being less about the numbers and more just being about doing the right thing or doing the right thing for your people? So I'd love to get that take for you guys. Yeah, so I'm just gonna say, as the practitioner on the panel <laughs> who has to live with my executives and sell your products to them, which I believe in all three of them, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, of course, and, and I hope to be a customer. Um, I think it's really important for us as practitioners to really stop and think about why are we trying to constantly measure the value of what it is that we're doing or the return on what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. We have to be super careful about that. There are no other parts of our organization, like the finance organization doesn't walk around and saying, let me show you my ROI on why I did this analysis. Let me show you the ROI on this. There are not many other groups in our organizations that walk around trying to demonstrate the value of what it is that they do. So that said, I think that the work that all of you do here and the work that I want to do within my organization is all around how do we attract and how do we retain talent. Mm -hmm. And you help with that. Mm -hmm. And so if we have a great employment brand where we can attract talent and retain talent, we get high levels of productivity and performance, mm -hmm. done. I'm not gonna go through a whole metrics around measuring the ROI of what it is that, that we do across the organization for employee health. Yeah. Sorry. No, that was, that was great. And I think, you know, to your point earlier, like a lot of this is really just kind of doing the right thing. And it helps that we're able to measure it now. We've got you know, two decades now of like measuring basically f f uh, fulfillment and purpose and health and, and longevity and, and tenure. And, and so, you know, the folks that we work with, they really care about that retention mm -hmm. thing. Because a salesperson, if that salesperson leaves after two years instead of three, that's like, I just saw a research report that said it's a $1.3 million loss on average if they leave after two instead of sticking around for three. And so, you know, when I'm in this conversation about what do we measure, measure fulfillment. Like measured, like do they feel like they can bring their whole selves to work and that their work is an expression of their values and, and the impact they want to have and the types of relationships that they value? Uh, you know, measure how they talk about it. So our net, net, uh, employee net promoter scores, like that's really important. Um, two thirds of the workforce is unfulfilled and they have a negative uh, promoter score of, of 64. Whereas the other ones who are fulfilled have a positive of, of 36. So it's, like that stuff matters in, in terms of uh, attracting the right talent because if people are saying, oh, it's a great place to work, then all of a sudden you don't have to do work so hard to develop and retain people. Mm -hmm. And so, customer retention is important too, yeah. right? So you have employee retention, but then if you can align that with customer retention scores, that's helpful also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I also think what's going on, our organizations are changing quite a bit. In the last 10 or 15 years, you go back 30 or 40 years, and I like to think of it as 
Well, I'm not that old to go back 30 or 40 years. <laughs> no. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but I, I, I think about the, <laughs> I think about like we're moving from kind of our organizations were really built kind of in, left, in a left brain world, right? And a lot of the, the, the true functions that came up, sales, even marketing really more recently has had a seat at the table. At, at a certain level, they, they do have metrics. They do have a return. I mean, te teams know if sales aren't doing well, right? And, and what we're going to do about that. I think what's happening, and, I, and I'm not saying, I'm not advocating for this hardcore RRI. But what I think is we're finally seeing this upswing in kind of the, the, the right brain approach in our organizations around wellness, around engagement, around culture. We're talking about this. How do we quantify these things? They're very hard. We need metrics. But I think when we fixate on the outcomes is the challenge, right? We need some guide marks. We need to know what we're doing um, or where we're putting our resources, right? So you run a big survey, but which of those things are the biggest drivers of engagement? If we know it's, it's leadership and communication, at least we'll put our efforts there but what we try to stay away from is the fixation on the, on the outcomes. Mm -hmm. we're, just, we're measuring our, our leaders, and they need to get a two-point ga gain on their engagement survey. Right. Because then what you get in this book called Prime to, Perform, per, uh, Prime to Perform, this thing called Cobra Farms, but you get these, these derivative, people do certain behaviors to get the outcome right. versus what we're talking about here, right. is how do we drive a really healthy organization with good data and good insights um, versus it's all about ROI and you just show me the numbers. And we talk a lot about trying to use good data to tell strong stories, right? So connecting the right and the left brain together. The data is, is, is the piece that's connecting and talking to our, our left brain, but the stories, what's happening in our organization, who are these people, and what's the impact, and how's this impacting our turnover? And, and tying those two together to tell compelling stories to get your leaders to see it and talking in their language, but to drive change that's going to you know, impact your organization and build a, a more healthy culture. Yeah, and I think that concept of telling stories is a really interesting point because being someone who you know, has a position within a benefits brokerage firm, like that's who I, I work for, um, we often found that this whole concept of wellness was something that lives inside of the HR benefit space, and so everything should be tied to a medical claim. <laughs> and <laughs> mm. it gets really hard to prove that, especially when a lot of the workforce now are millennials. Like you're, you're not making an impact on diabetes and these different things like you're focused on mental health or parenting or just general stress or any of those physical health issues that are being more preventative so you're not really going to see a huge impact on that and rather I think a lot of it comes into this storytelling side of there's no way to exactly measure that you were able to support someone through their dad that lives three states away having a heart attack or supporting someone through the birth of a child or supporting someone mm. going through a stressful mm -hmm. situation um, so I think that storytelling is really interesting interesting and I'm curious just some of your other thoughts on what are some of those other things you do measure that maybe aren't numerical like we we're talking about like do they have a friend at work do yes. they have you know some things like that so yeah I mean that, that's that's the one that that is most fulfilling to me and that's what we talk about a lot in imperative is that having deep intimate relationships at work I mean that's who we are as a, as a species mm -hmm. and we want to have real talk with real people and not to have just the abstract of business be you know our whole relationship. And so, um, you know, some of my favorite stories are when people cry. Like that happens a lot in our business. People like get connected to who they are, their purpose, their impact, their heartbreak. You know, they see, like I, I cried in a, <laughs> in a training seeing some of Do you have Kleenex? Yeah, yeah. Like, 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 <laughs> like, seeing, like basically seeing a new way to love my dad. In a, and I was like, wow, you know. So like it's those moments where we, we can truly bring a human economy uh, in the room when, when we see somebody's humanity, mm. when somebody like owns up to something, confesses, is vulnerable, mm. um, talks about why they're here or you know, why they're doing other things in the world, not just at work. I don't have any stories about crying, but one of the things <laughs> that we did at Qualcomm that I think anyone can do in any organization is a program called 52 Weeks. So there's 52 weeks in a year, and we went out to our different employees and asked, tell me a story, a story about a team, a story about a leader, a story about a new employee, a story about somebody who struggled, a story about a product that worked, a story about a failure. We collected all those stories, and then every week we would send a story a week to each one of our new employees, and that was just via email. Super easy to do. Everyone has stories across your organization. Go collect them. That is part mm -hmm. of our role to do that. That went from email to, you know, from one week to 52 weeks. Every time a new employee came, we registered every new employee on that email. Mm. And one day the CEO came into my office and was like, tomorrow I would have ran into someone in the elevator. And they said, I really liked week 13. What is this? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, it's these stories that we've collected across the organization. And he was like, well, can I get on it too? And so by the time, you know, we had 30,000 employees, we had 25,000 employees 
that were getting these stories emailed to them every week. And then we created a website that had pictures. And it was a way of communicating culture without saying, this is who we are. It was mm. really, let me tell you the stories. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you just a quick story. So um, at Qualcomm, we had no dress code for our employees. We were here in San Diego. You could wear flip-flops, bring your surfboard, bring your bike, whatever it is. <laughs> Same thing here at XCOM. We have some people who are not choosing to wear shoes, which is completely fine. Um, whatever it is <laughs> that you need to do, these day. are engineers, right? So um, our, one day, our, our chief technical officer at Qualcomm saw that one of the engineers was walking around with pink bunny slippers. <laughs> and he immediately sent out an email to the entire employee base and said, while Qualcomm does not have a dress code, nobody shall knowingly wear shoes with ears. <laughs> that was it. Not knowingly. Like if you were like, you know, something happened overnight, you just accidentally slipped them on, okay. But not, you shall not knowingly wear shoes with ears. And I tell you that story because that gives you a good sense of who we were as a company, right, of what the culture is in the organization. So go find those stories. I mean, we had a story about an employee who um, we laid off. And that employee told the story about how we treated them so well as an employee, really? and they understood why we were divesting that business and why there was no longer a role for that person, but that the, that the company treated them so well. In a public audience, we, a public Yes, audience. we Forum. put those wow. stories up there. That's great. So all of those different stories, the failures about a team that didn't do very well, about a leader that did something great, about a person who struggled with a project mm -hmm. or a product. And all of those stories, I mean, they have them all across your organization. Go collect them and share them, because that's, I think, mm -hmm. the best way to communicate culture. I've written up about it. If you want to look up 52 weeks, you might be able to see that in some of the other presentations I've done. Can I ask, did, did it come from like, creating that culture of vulnerability where people are willing to tell those kinds of stories? Is the genesis of that, is that, again, sorry to use the term, but tops down? No. No, that came just no, organically. No, and I mean, it's even in the culture the ramp stuff, a lot of it bubbles up from the employee base. Yeah. So it's taking that information and sharing from it. From the I mean, EDS results My leaders you... didn't even know what we were doing with this 52 weeks thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, they're yeah. Like, what is that? What's this email? Yeah, what's this week? email? Yeah, yeah. What is this? No, I want to see what these stories yeah. are, too, because they don't know all those stories. And the higher up you get in an organization, the less connected you are to what's happening. Mm -hmm. Did, know, they, did the they get involved? Did they of course sharing? they did. They, they shared all their stories. Uh, how did you? We had some good ones. I like this play between nice. the, the organic, but also, I mean, there is, and we'll probably get to this. This, yeah. what, what is the role of leaders in culture, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. But uh, to your point as well, that we do, in a lot of organic stuff can bubble up as well. I love it. How did you drive that behavior in turn? Like people obviously wanted to tell these stories. Oh, yeah, people um, want to talk about themselves. Have you seen Instagram? Have you seen Snapchat? Have you seen yeah, yes, Everybody yeah, wants yeah. to share everything about but, themselves. But they're usually highlight reels. <laughs> and what I heard you say there, or what I think I heard you say was, they could be stories of, like, triumphs. Yeah. But they could also be stories of another nature as well. Totally. No, that, I'll tell you a really interesting quick story, too. So yeah. we had the president of our company who was, he had come into Qualcomm at the time as a head of legal. Mm. Okay? Head of legal. We're a small company at the time, maybe seven, 800 people. And there's a very big lawsuit that's going on with a very big company that I will not name here. <laughs> and all of a sudden, on the fax machine, they're working late at night, all of a sudden, on the fax machine, a fax comes in, mm. and it was meant for the other attorney, not mm -hmm. for our attorney, and it was the, the brief of what they were going to do Lovely. on the trial. Mm. So he runs into our CEO's office, and he's like, oh my god, this is golden. I have the other person's brief. We are going to win this case tomorrow. I have everything right here. It came in our fax, fax machine. I say fax machine like most millennials. I have no idea what a fax machine is. Comes in on the fax machine, and he reads it, and he's thinking, this is like golden. I've got it. Like rip the paper off back. Take machine? it off the yeah. fax machine, yes. <laughs> Runs into our CEO's office and goes, look, Erwin, oh my god, look, I got the entire brief. We're going to win tomorrow. And he said to him, Steve, you go rip that up, and you go call them right now and tell them you accidentally received their brief. We are not going to trial. Now, well, that is a story about ethics. Yeah, that's values. That is, that's values, that's mm -hmm. ethics, that's wellness, that's do you connect to that. And here Steve goes, I felt like such an idiot. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, that's a good vulnerability story from an executive about something you know, that they had to live with, humility there. So we've talked a lot about stories, I'm just, and I opened this up by talking about storytelling with data. No, no, it's great. I love those stories. I just want to, I great. think a quote that we use often that I'll reiterate, I think is important, is a Maya Angelou quote, and I, I'm, I'm probably not going to say exactly, but the idea is, People will often forget what, what you told them, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so just think about that in your organizations. You know, how are we you know, how are we treating people? Another story, you talked about the layoff story and it triggered for me. I think Stuart, is his name Butterfield, the Slack CEO? Brad um, Butterfield. Yeah. Yeah. I thought Stuart. I beat him. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Okay. 
So it, I heard their, 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 their head of people told a story about how um, he said basically anybody that leaves, we're going to give them three months severance. And she was pushing back and forth, and they eventually came to like eight weeks or whatever. But you know, she was coming from this approach of we don't need to do this. Why are we doing this? So after it was all done, they came up with this agreement. She asked him, why, why did you push so hard for that? And he said, you can tell a lot about a culture by the way it varies its dead. Totally. Mm -hmm. Right? So what you totally. just said about the, the, the person leaving totally. or the idea with the facts, it's yeah. like, yeah, it's easy when everything's going great, right. but are you, from the beginning to end of that life cycle, are you treating people with, with respect? Right. Do you mm -hmm. care about them? Mm -hmm. You know, I know I was at LinkedIn as well, mm -hmm. this idea of if we make a bad hire, it's, we're as much responsible as that person, so yeah. if it doesn't work out, how do we do this in a good way? I mean, this mm -hmm. is what I think we're driving mm -hmm. at, is building these cultures of, mm -hmm. of humanity, taking care of people with compassion, mm -hmm. and these people come back. I mean, it's a, it's a yeah. small world, like it or not, also the talent situation right now. Mm -hmm. Like, they're out talking. They're, you know, this is your brand. 100%. You know, from beginning mm -hmm. to end. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. whole, you know, how do you bury your dead? I think about that a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think Wong said that note of you talking about the leaders having good ethics and things is so one of the things that we were talking about when we were kind of having our pre-panel discussion was this concept of leadership. And, you know, most leaders, I think, are genuine people from the standpoint of they're trying to make their business successful. They, they do want to take care of their people. Like, there are definitely some, you know, dict dictatorships out there. But for the most part, I work with a lot of companies where they are good leaders, but they also aren't always in tune with what the employees actually need. And mm -hmm. I think scary part is that a lot of people are scared to ask the question of what do you need because it opens the floodgates and then they feel like they can't deliver on everything. So when you guys are working with leaders in your own companies or selling into leaders, as we mm -hmm. talk about that ROI being important, is they do kind of want numbers and they do want data of why should we do this. So how do you essentially feel that you can sell that into leaders, but likewise also kind of build that case for how leaders need to be involved in the actual implementation and continued success of whatever it is that you implement or do? Well, imperative is all about purpose. Mm -hmm. So for you, it really aligns with what leaders believe, right? Yeah, you got to have purpose to be a leader. Yeah. yeah. So maybe you could tell folks, I don't know how much they know about your company, but I'm yeah. so... I'm so amazed well, with what you. it is that you do because I feel like purpose is the number one thing that connects an employee to the Absolutely. place they work. Yeah, uh, and, and it's it's critical to have leaders involved. I mean, especially you know, given what we do, so we activate purpose and fulfillment at scale for a number of big companies, um, and you know the leadership has to be involved mm -hmm. because you know I think I think uh, you said it. You said. Uh, Believe in it, embody it, and teach set it. A standard, set a standard. standard. That's standard. right. Totally yeah. yeah. So, so, so for a leader uh, to say, "Yeah, go do this," without doing it, her mm -hmm. himself, it's it's basically dead in the water. Mm -hmm. So we will bring leaders through a little pilot themselves, and they'll they'll activate their purpose. They'll have mm -hmm. these really intimate one-on-one -on -one peer coaching conversations with each other. And then they'll be like, "I cried," you know, or <laughs> like, I, "I I really get why my job is fulfilling because." We often don't take the time to actually harvest those fulfillment moments. And so in a peer coaching conversation where it's you know, not like a therapist, like there's no hierarchy there, it's just two people being real with each other for 40 minutes, they actually get to see why they are fulfilled, like what actually drives them, what their purpose drivers are. And then they can you know, start to mark to market and say like, oh, if, that, if I really dig these one-on-one -on -one conversations or I really like making this kind of impact, and I can go do that. But you know, to your point, like the leaders have to be like, guys, I just discovered a new planet in the solar system. Like it really has to occur for, for them mm -hmm. that way mm -hmm. uh, in order for everyone else to be like, yes, let's change the culture. Let's have a purpose-driven culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think like on the work that you do with surveys, because I did a lot of them mm -hmm. you know, throughout my entire career, um, you're always trying to link the leader to the results so that you can take action in the business. So that's another piece where you're linking At the leader. And link, linking the leader, and what I was going to say, because what Brandon just spoke about, I'm completely with. I love those moments. <laughs> um, but I will also say, it goes back to the, like, the more the, the, the pragmatic approach. And what I've seen, in, so I'm on our people science team, so I do a lot of work with our organizations when they run surveys mm -hmm. and delivering the results. And with the right sort of tools, I often say it's like the Fitbit, a, a Fitbit analogy, that it's kind of like once you put a Fitbit on, you can act like you're not getting your steps, but when you see it every day, you see the results, behaviors do change. Mm -hmm. So sometimes with leaders, and I've worked with, 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 with HR leaders, 
um, where it's like, we're trying to get this in, how do we sell this to them? And sometimes it's like, sell the base, let's just get it in. It's amazing what happens once you put the Fitbit on mm -hmm. and you go back the day after a survey closes, not three months later, but the day after and say, well, here's, here's it, what it is. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I'm in the room doing that, here's the raw numbers. And you, you can feel the defensiveness sometimes, but you know what, they go back, they go to bed at night, they toss and turn with it, and they come back the next day and they've had to swallow that pill sometimes. It's a tough pill when, I can, when we can look directly and say, well, your whole entire senior leadership team is 10 points off compared to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this, that, or whatever, but then they go home and go, gosh, wow, that was, so, you know, sometimes allow the defensiveness to pass, but to the point, just put the Fitbit on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and the, like, let, sometimes let those results, those stories will tell themselves to the leaders and having tools that can drill down to those leader levels. So yeah. we can go to a manager and say, here's your team, here's your results. Yeah. Take, take, take a look at that uh, in a healthy, positive way um, and let them almost, you know, the goal is... They have to own it. They have to own it mm -hmm. and they have to, sometimes letting people come to their own conclusions and being there to support them or nudge them or when we have an inspiration engine, here's some ideas, but not telling them the, con like the consultative model where it's like, here's what we found, here's what you need to do versus here's what we see, what do you think? You know your business mm -hmm. better than we do, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like let's have a conversation. Um, we're about nine have been so if we want to leave some wow. time for questions. Um, so if anyone has some questions, and if you don't, I have more questions for them. So anyone have any questions in the audience that you'd like to ask the panel? No, all right. Okay. No, we got one. If you're with a company that um, already has an existing culture, maybe it isn't, you know, like the, these are the types of things I, uh, I hear a lot of my daughter was in the market, I saw a lot of young I work for a university. I have a staff of about 110 marketing people. There's a very, very um, uh, long-defined culture. So how do you how do you start? Hmm. You know, if you're if, if you're in that kind of environment, how you know how how would you how would you start out? I can share about that. Uh, pilots, like. Just have a, have a, you know, as they say, a safe to fail experiment where you're going to go try something with a group of people at a low cost, low risk, low time and, and prove it out. I mean, that's what all of our clients started really with really small pilots. And then once it get, gets proven out, you know, like to your point about the Fitbit analogy, like when, once people start to see, oh my God, purpose actually feels good and we're seeing results and then it's improving tenure and net promoter, all this stuff starts happening. So yeah, like start small. Like, don't try to like reinvent the whole culture with like one idea or one meeting. Be like, hey, we're going to take 20, 20 people over here and do this thing. Yeah, so, I, I like think, the story sharing idea. Yeah. yeah, and I'll add to that and then yeah, go ahead. But um, I think along with that too is really just getting people kind of that having a friend at work to, to support each other because you could roll out programs, you can pay for things, you can do all sorts, but really it's just having people talk and, and build that culture of being supportive. So I think, you know, ERGs like employee resource groups are super important. So kind of put it out there like, hey, there's a group of parents that are going to meet at this time or they're going to share this email alias to just trade advice or we have a group really focused on mental health initiatives. They're going to meet at this time or trade ideas. And we've seen that at a lot of, you know, some of the companies I work with that have absolutely no budget, spread out population, all of that, and really just kind of finding the right avenues for people to connect on topics they care about helps build this supportive culture in itself, which I think is really powerful And that, like, story So when I started side. at Qualcomm in 1992, we were 700 employees. And when I left fax there, fax machines everywhere. Fax machines everywhere. <laughs> we were hiring 100 people a week, 100 people a day sometimes. Wow. And when I left there about three years ago, there were 31,000. Wow. So I, I saw a tremendous scale, and I saw what it took to build a culture. Um, I've worked for the last three years in startups, and now with XCOM, um, when I started there, there were about 15 employees, and now we're at 55 <clears throat> three months later, and we're growing to 100 tomorrow. It's crazy. Um, and I'm building culture. And one of the things that you know, I do a lot of is kind of reading what's happening with the executive team and reading the employees. But the number one activity that I do, and I'm not doing it yet with XCOM because we're still too small, um, is I ask, I get a group of employees in the room and I say, okay, give me one word to describe this company. One word. And get the list of words. And I'm telling you, everybody will have one word about that company. Mm -hmm. Put those up on the wall. That's essentially what your culture is. Mm -hmm. That's essentially who you are. Because mm -hmm. those are the people that are sitting in the room, those are leaders, that's everybody. It's what is one word to describe this company. Mm -hmm. You can also ask them, what is one thing that you wish this company would do differently in one word? Mm -hmm. The other thing you can ask them is, what do you wish we were, one word? Mm -hmm. 
So if you can get those three things, you can aggregate, right? So one is if you just want to know who we are today, it's what is one word to describe this company? Second is what do you wish? And third is if we could do something differently, what would it be? But just get one word. And that will help you shape culture. I think, I'll, I'll be quick about this, but you hit on two elements. One is what you just said was listen. So that's big in our world. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? And it, yeah, we have tools at scale to help you listen to, to your employees and make sense of it. And number two is this idea that, I think what you just hit on is that you as a leader, this idea that you own it, you have to go fix it. The culture is there, right. it exists. So I think what you said is like, how do we, it's almost like the idea with Michelangelo and, and, the, and the block of, the block of. Shape it. Right, you should, it's in there, your culture's yeah. there. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna put the culture on the organization. How do we chip away all the parts we don't want to leave behind the, <laughs> the, the beautiful piece that's left behind that, that's your you know, culture? Um, and people are craving it, they want it. They wanna show up and feel good about work. And, I, the, and the way that you can kind of, you have to reinforce it in the organization, mm -hmm. right? So if you wanna shape it, and you want to do meditation before yeah. your meeting, that has to be rewarded, reinforced. You yeah. have to be telling people this is okay. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do those things, it's mm -hmm. not going to continue to happen in the culture. So if you want to take the what do we want to be versus what we are, that takes reward and reinforcement yeah. theory to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more tomorrow. I, I, I took over, as I mentioned, about 13 weeks ago to sales efforts at Headspace. And one of the things that I noticed is they had a really good overall corporate culture but that the selling team itself did not have a subculture. And there's a greater philosophical question as to whether you believe there should or should not be one of those. My personal philosophical leaning is there should, specific to the sales team. And so, um, as opposed to looking back, I think the first thing I would ask myself is, why are you looking to change your culture? There's obviously some underlying drivers or things that are not happening within the business the way you want them to happen within the business, or something along those lines a thesis that is driving your desire to change culture. So I'd first of all like sit down with the leadership team and get really clear on what it is you think you're solving for by addressing this because it is the heart and soul of every great innovative organization is its culture, I believe. Then what I did was before we did anything else, I sat down, I got to know the team, I built contacts with them, I built trust as best you can in a couple of months. And my first act was to sit down and pull them all the way off site and not do any of this work and in the business stuff, but just sit down and define our culture and our values. And that exercise came not too dissimilar to your own tomorrow, but in a slightly different format where we wrote down the kind of place that we always dreamt of working in. Mm -hmm. And I told them that for the first time, maybe ever in your careers, you're gonna have an opportunity to sit down and um, imbue the DNA of who we are and who we're gonna be and how we're gonna operate going forward, which is a hugely unique opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we went through this, we wrote down, it was a whole long big day, lots of warm rooms and coffee breaks and all the rest. We went through the whole thing and we went through a prioritization matrix, which is just like a two by two for size of prize on Y axis and likelihood of success on the X axis, just in terms of these cultural tenets as it related to our sales goals and productivity goals. And we narrowed it down. Everything that went into the top right section, i.e. highest size of prize, highest likelihood of success, they were the things that began to form the bedrock of our culture alongside the initial why question that we asked is what we need to address. And then it comes back down to reinforcement. I mean, mm -hmm. I will always, um, this is where I'll net out this answer, but like yeah. when I'm answering questions around what we do on deals, how we operate with data, what I should do in this specific instance, like I always go back to the cultural framework always and point to that as our sword and our shield of how we would operate. And I also not only reward those who uh, perpetuate and build upon the culture that we're trying to build, but I also see a cultural transgression as big as missing your number as a sales mm. leader. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that people need to understand that. And that for me, the one thing that I have and some of the human resource leaders may not like this in the room, but like integrity for me is a one strike rule. If you are caught in conscious deception, not to say that that's happened before, but that's just like a Gordon value that like I'm gonna take everywhere I go. That's like a, everything else I'm willing to talk about, but that one is off the table. And so I think it starts with leadership. If you need to reset, you need to ask yourself why, and if you wanna start off from the beginning, is pull the right people into the tent, ask them who they wanna be, prioritize that down, make sure you have alignment and agreement with your stakeholders, and then move forward. And anytime anybody asks me any question, I will always look back to the culture and values and say, does this support that? And if, in, if it is at odds with those culture and those values, then it does not happen. It's that simple. And I'll have those debates with anybody at any level throughout the entire company. Mm -hmm.
Any other questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. One more. I'll just quickly, I mean, that's a big question, but yeah. <laughs> I think the values are really, I see the values are like these, these, and they should, we say no more, really four to six tops. Like these should be fundamental mm -hmm. pillars that hold up everything else you do that you can always fall back if you're in a situation and say, am I in the right direction? So R is courage to be vulnerable, learn faster through feedback, um, you know, trust others to make decisions and amplify others. But there's, there's four, and I think if they're done well, they should not, they should not contradict somebody being, bringing their fullness to work. It's a way that we're going to show up and behave a collective agreement. And inside mm -hmm. of that framework of these kind of these pillars of how we are going to collectively treat each other and should be signed on to when you join, like, no, these are our values, especially if you have a strong organization. Inside of that framework, this is what this is the glue that helps us work as an organization together. Bring your whole self to work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, inside of that. So, you know, courage to be vulnerable. If, if your truth is that I'm never going to be vulnerable, I'm not going to take feedback. And it, that might be a problem, but maybe there needs to be a better organization or different values. But I think it's rare because I think we've built, you know, we have these, these, these pillar of values and that we also encourage you to be you, show up. Mm -hmm. And I think the two can coexist, especially if you've really been thoughtful and you've, you've whittled it down to like not too many values, just a fundamental core that you can look back on and mm -hmm. say, I'm making a decision. I'm being challenged right now. Mm -hmm. How does this look against those values? Yeah. But who you are, how you show up. As long as it's inside of these basic values, bring it. We want it here, at least yeah. in, our, in our opinion. I think just to bookend that, you know, maybe I heard within your question, and keep me honest here, but is tops down culture versus bottoms mm -hmm. up was part of the question, perhaps, was it? Yeah, that's, that's a part of it. I Do you ask me something? Steering, there's different elements that we want to bring up from bottoms up. Yeah. Like the, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it, for me, it has to be a relationship. Yeah, yeah. it's a relationship. Well, what I think it depends a little bit, uh, obviously, on size of organization. So it's a little bit easier to go bottoms up, tops down, and meet in the middle and align on what that is um, if the organization's small enough. If the organizations are larger, you're looking at things like EBS results, et cetera. We could obviously talk about this all day, but we are at time. So um, we'll be uh, out in the hall for any questions that you guys have and like jot down our name, shoot us a LinkedIn message. We'd love to hear from you guys, but thank you. Um, hopefully get some good takeaways and yeah, it was great.